The Indian education sector is in a mess, right from the lottery of nursery admissions to the ridiculously high cutoffs in colleges. Students and parents in India suffer like nowhere else in the world. Does the government have a plan to revive this very important sector? Joining us today on the Right to Be Heard Town Hall is Union Minister of State for HRD, Dr. Shashi Tharoor. We've got lots of school children, teachers, college students, young anxious parents, each of them ready and raring to have a go at the minister. I'll start with that lady who's been insisting she wants to ask the first question. My question, Dr. Tharoor, is uh, nursery admission uh, procedures have been completed by every parent. All schools are busy formulating their admission lists. It's very late to change anything in basic pre-approved policy as, uh, as late as this. So um, the lottery system is an absolutely unacceptable way to uh, admit new students, especially siblings staying in the same neighborhood of the same parent. But what would you like to see us do? First of all, the ministry doesn't decide on nursery admissions. We can have a general policy environment that helps schools decide. But what would you as a parent like to see happen? I would like uh, to see the, gui the guidelines that were on the school net, which I, uh, which I uh, read and decided upon when I chose a school for my little sibling daughter. My son is in the same school. I would like those to be adhered to. So you want but as far as possible the children from the same home going should be able to yes, go to sir. the same yes, school? Sir. Sir. Yes, and sir. And the point she's making yes, is about perfect sense. continuity yes, yes. in policy. The fact that you know, no, people no, no, sign no. up thinking the policy is X and by the time it comes to implementation, the policy becomes Y. No, it's not that. It's the sheer pressure of numbers. Many of these schools find that because they don't have a simple way of making an effective choice that they end up in some cases with a lottery. In some cases, there are schools that uh, have their own marking system. They'll give points for certain kinds of qualities. There are kids age three and four are being interviewed for admission, which seems slightly preposterous when you think about it. But all of these are because schools are trying to find a way to actually make the selections. I think what the lady says is perfectly reasonable. Thank you so I'm much. I'm not sure what the ministry can do about it. Because these are essentially school policies. Put but I'm very happy to take this idea back and see whether we can't encourage. Put a kind word and a recommendation. Yeah, if we, if we can encourage schools, for example, okay, to have amongst here, their criteria keeping siblings together, no, but it might be the, the larger point, you know, look at how anxious and nervous she is. Of yes, course. Yes, Why should a parent completely. be on a knife's edge trying to get her child into school? This well, is a very fundamental expectation that people have from the state. And just look at her face. Look at how anxious and nervous she is. Well, it depends on which school she's... <laughs> no, but it's the same with all parents. The, state, the states will, of course, obviously ensure that every child is in a school. So if the child is not in the school she wants, the child is not going to be deprived of schooling. Schooling is available. But her concern, understandably, is to keep her child with the sibling in the same school. My question is also in my capacity as a parent who's applying for a sibling child. Mm. I just want to query you on your views regarding the point system and the recent, you know, challenge that the High Court is looking at. Um, to my mind, it's empirical, it's transparent, it's rational. But of course, the court is looking at systems like draw of lots. And as a parent, I'd rather take my chances with an identified system as opposed to a draw of lots. But what are your views regarding Personally, that? as a parent, I agree with you. I and mean, I've been through putting twins into school but a long time ago now. As far as uh, the logic of this concern, if you actually have criteria and one of the criteria might be siblings, for example, and you get points for having a sibling in the school, that makes the help, helps the school make a decision. But you know in our system, ministers do not preempt or prejudge high court decisions. We'll have to wait and see what the judges come up with. All I want to say is as a parent, not as a minister, I agree with what you're saying. Okay, let's take a question from that gentleman over there. Last year, I applied in 22 schools for my kid, but I couldn't get admission in a single school. Reason being oh. again, the point system. This is what, nursery level or higher? Nursery level. What happened, as per the Right to Education Act and Article 21 of the Constitution, there should be education to all. There, should, there is no ground for the discrimination. But what happens, the government passes the notifications and there is the chances of discrimination by the notifications. What happened, by the, I have the single kid. No sibling, no point for siblings. I am not the alumni from those schools, no alumnus point. I am residing far away from the good schools, no point for distance. So where should I go then? So that's why I am looking for the high court's judgment. If they are going for the draw system, then I will appreciate it. Please. No, I think it's important that people understand how different families and different parents will have different preferences for an outcome in this. The truth is our country is enormous. Even the RT doesn't really apply to nursery schooling because RT says 
eight years of compulsory schooling from six to 14. And your nursery kids are younger than that. But you know, we all as parents want our kids to get a good education from very early on. And many of us have preferences as to which schools we'd like our kids to go. The thing is, as a social mechanism, an admission policy in a school system essentially has to try and take into account the enormous pressures on it from numbers that are impossible to digest of people with varying circumstances, as the two of you have just already illustrated with your questions. And sometimes some will be unhappy with one outcome and some will be unhappy with the other. But all I want to say is the sympathy is there where we can help as a ministry in terms of encouraging a certain policy attitude, we will. But the fact of the matter is that when you get to 6 to 14, I assure you no child will be left behind. And the kind of problem you're referring to will not apply at that level. At yeah. nurseries, it's a little more complicated. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Tadathur. I'm here to present the parent community of Delhi sure. NCR and Panina level also. And I'm here not for nursing only. I'm on RTE. Right. First of all, I would like to add to your point. I would not like to correct you, but there's a provision uh, clause 11 and clause 35A, which says the RT would be implemented from nursery itself of RT. Okay. Now, on a broader perspective, I would like to uh, uh, ask you just one question. RT just say two points: neighborhood and uh, you know uh, random and just. Yeah, now, it, you know the most of the good schools are you know area centric. Now let's say, I'm not over Delhi, I'm talking all over India, pan level. Let's say, you know, uh, XYZ uh, locality has got uh, creamy layer schools, but the, the parents who are staying uh, 15 kilometers, you know, from that place have got fundamental right to get admission. But the, your RT says on neighborhood should be given preference. So on my forum, we have got 55,000 parents, admissions.com. Today they are fighting if draw lot comes. Why, like, like the parents are not fighting whether the system should be scrapped or not. They're fighting whether if I'm staying, uh, let's say I want to apply to Vassan Valley, who's right? The person who's fighting is saying, no, it should be only up to three or five kilometers like EWs they give, or the person who's staying 15 kilometers from Vassan Valley. Okay. Now, I mean, the fact is, again, the High Court is going to be ruling on this and one can't, one can't prejudge a judicial matter. But I have to say that one of the issues here is the very understandable issue of parental choice. So you and the, the gentleman there were saying, I don't mind if I'm 15 kilometers away. I'll take care of getting my kid to school. I just want to get into that school. And there are other parents saying, I want my kid into the school next door. I don't want to have to go 15 kilometers away. So you have to understand there are both sets of concerns, both sets of parents. We wait and see what the court says. Dr. Sarur, I just want to go away a little bit from private schools. <clears throat> I want to, you know, you say, what can the ministry do? So what the ministry can do is to ensure that the government school system functions in such a way that Nobody needs to put look at only the private school system. So in Vasan Kunj, where my school is situated, there are at least 12 government schools there. If the government schools in that area worked at 70% efficiency, forget 100% efficiency, why would anybody pay money to come to Vasan Valley School? It would also put pressure on schools like me, or on ours, to perform much better to get people to pay to come to us. So the RTE actually refers to education and then we try and figure out the edu education is you know private school or government school so as a minister when you say what can the ministry do the ministry can very well make sure that the government schools function in such a way that it changes the pressure that we're looking for i agree yeah. totally I and mean, frankly the emphasis on quality is something that we are very keen on at school and college level because for the longest time our educational philosophy has been focused on inclusion because we came into independence with a country at 17% literacy. We managed to bring it up to 74. We've had historically groups left out and excluded from the educational process because of caste and religion, birth and other factors. We've tried to bring them in. So in all this focus on inclusion and in terms of actually promoting equity, we have frankly left behind sometimes the concern about quality. And this is now the new emphasis. We must get more quality in. And I couldn't agree more with Arun Kapoor that we must get the schools Absolutely, the government schools have to improve. Our dropout rates have to decline. Enrollments have to improve and what they're offered has to improve in the schools. When you say the government school system is the biggest in the country, you're only partly right. It varies from state to state. Uh, in Delhi, it's the largest. In a place like Tripura, 91% of the schools are government schools. In Kerala, only 12% of schools are government schools. The majority are private schools, private aided and private unaided. So it varies from state to state. And of course, in our system, in the constitution, education is in the concurrent list. And states essentially have the biggest onus of the burden here. But we're very happy to work with states to improve education at schools. And we've been doing a lot of things. And I say we, I mean in recent years, 
For example, the proposals of the National Curriculum Framework are being admired around the world. We are really producing a, a, a curriculum framework that will produce Indian school leavers of sufficient quality and sufficient breadth of intellectual range that will prepare them for anything that you want a child anywhere in the world to be prepared for. But I agree with you, the better government schools get, the more actually will be the pressure on private schools to outperform them and, and justify their fees, and the better it will be for those who can't afford the fees in the first place, who are the people the majority of us want to reach. No, but you're saying that the question is what is being done on the ground to improve government schools. Yes, that lady uh, has a question. Good afternoon. I wanted to ask you about the social prejudice that's being practiced against the uh, underprivileged actually in the classroom space. Uh, so how can we counter that marginalization, for instance, them being pushed off to the back benches and being advised against active participation in class? How can we counter that social discrimination well, that's at illegal. the grassroots level? The schools have been told by circular, by visits, by oral instructions that they cannot in any way discriminate against these extra kids, that they cannot be seated in one group or seated separately, that they cannot be, have, have any prohibitions against them that other kids don't have. They have to be treated completely indistinguishably from the other kids. And if the school doesn't do it, there are actions we can take. The fact is, of course, the capacity to inspect and see how it's going on. If we get complaints, we will certainly take cognizance of them. We do not want these children to be discriminated against. I would defeat the entire purpose of creating the kind of system we're trying to create. No, but there have already been complaints of how the wrong kids have gotten in. Schools, some of them at least, have found ways of circumventing the system that was sought to be created and they're finding ways of relatively rich people getting in through the art. No, the fact is that, uh, that once the admissions take place, then the school has to treat everybody alike and there'll be some who are getting in on the basis of the 25% extra and there are some who've gotten through other, other, other means. But essentially, as far as I'm aware, most schools are accommodating people of what would traditionally be called underprivileged communities. Let me add one more thing on the government schools. You know, we look at the nationwide picture. What is the government doing? We're pumping a lot of money into the system for one thing. You've heard of the Sarva Shiksha Abhyan. Hundreds and thousands of crores are going into the state governments to go into, into schooling, including primary schooling. We're trying, for example, to ensure that midday meals are provided of sufficient quality so that poor kids will stay and will have an incentive to stay. We're trying to ensure that teachers are of certain quality, that they pass teacher eligibility tests, that they have a certain capacity, and that that's monitored and they're improved, that the teachers stay on, and that we cut down on the ridiculous levels of absenteeism in some parts of our country. So we're trying to take action across the board on all these things that have been deficient in government schools. But it doesn't mean we've solved them overnight. These are not problems that are going to be washed, you know, wished away with a magic wand. Hello, sir. Uh, you mentioned about the teachers and everything. I so want to believe you, sir. But, sir, there's, a, there's one sign which I'm, a I'm having a constant con conflict with. So we went to various schools. We uh, designed a project for underprivileged, uh, traditionally called underprivileged students. Right. So we went to various schools, MCD schools, Kendra Vidyalaya schools, all of them. So we were stunned to the core when we uh, realized, when we learned, we, we had a word with the teachers and the students. Sir, the, teach, uh, the students, as you were mentioning and the boasting or the backing about the literacy rate, which is increasing day by day, I completely concur to that. But these students could not write their complete, uh, complete, complete sentence in English. Mm. And we realized when we talked to the teachers, so this is an inter interesting reply which they were, gave us to us. They were like, they said to us, so there is beta, you don't understand, there's a pressure on us also. We need to show the results. No matter what, even if the child passes, even he or she is capable of or not, but you will have to pass it because you have to show results. Whatever happens in the school, even if there is a commission uh, coming to the school, they are well informed beforehand. Mm. So they just plan, they just try to uh, enact any, anything or everything, but nothing substantially is happening. Just by popping into a lot of money, your problem, the problem is not solved. You have to check it out at regular intervals. Okay, and you that's asked your question. Let him ask. No, I think these are all very important concerns. I would caution against generalizing for the entire country on the basis of a handful of schools. I'm sorry to hear that there are schools where these things are happening, but I can assure you that that's not true of all schools. However, as a general proposition, I agree with you, we're not happy with educational outcomes coming out of many of these schools. I want to stress that on the question of evaluating what they're doing yeah. uh, and the pressure for results and so on, we've actually introduced something called the CCE, the Continuing and Comprehensive Evaluation. The idea being that you don't just wait for one exam and the results and the marks and the pressure to show pass marks. You actually evaluate the child throughout the school year through a series of processes, not just written examinations. So the teacher has the onus of being able to identify qualitatively how the child is doing and help guide the child towards doing better. That's a very new concept in India. It's only come in in the last few years. We're trying to push it right through the government school system and we've encouraged private schools to do it as well. 
this idea that evaluation should not be just a question of marks at the end of a year, but should be a continuous process is one that must infuse our education, school and college throughout, and we're heading in that direction. Okay. Sir, the gentleman um, has a picture he wants yeah, to show. Yeah, sir, uh, uh, like I'm just adding to what he's point. We have, uh, I'm, this is Sanjay Gupta from Chetna NGO, which for first treat children in various areas. So this is, these are pictures from Jhansi and Agra, where the schools are used uh, as kettle shed. The My schools God. which are uh, flooded with water, there is no system. Why the concern is that uh, the organizations who are working so hard to implement, uh, to shoulder the responsibility with RTE are not able to put children into the schools because they, they are dropped out after some time. And this is because of the poor infrastructures, poor uh, system. There is no teachers. Teachers are not going uh, in the schools. And this is very uh, sad in that sense. Secondly is that uh, India, like uh, we are spending only 4.2% of our GDP, whereas the recommendation was around 6% by the Kothari Commission. So why are we are taking, taking so much time? And this is with the irony that we are charged with the education cess. We are already paying education cess at the individuals. So why that money is not going for the purpose for which it is charged? No, it is, it yeah. is going. It yeah. is going. But uh, as you said, as a percentage of GDP, because our GDP has been growing, even though our educational budget has been growing, it has not reached that 6% yeah. target. It's, it's a little lower. I want to stress that you're right to talk about infrastructure because in our Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan and now in the Madhima Shiksha Abhiyan, we are actually giving money also for infrastructure in so. schools. It's not only for the teachers and the midday meals and the schools, uh, I mean the educational part, it is also for classrooms, for toilet facilities which are so important. I mean, girls after a certain age, if they don't have a toilet to change in, what will, do will go home and not come back. I so. mean, you've really got fundamental needs in these Basic areas that you need to no, take but those care pictures of. Show but a lot pictures of the money are, is not being yes. used well. And these are like, sir, uh, the, and this is not, these are few samples from Agra only, but we have Jhansi, Gwalior, and all the Noida, you, you which is right. very close it vicinity. Shows that where we need to China China spend more energy yes. in inspecting yes, yes. Uh, all and of these schools, which the state governments are yeah. supposed to be doing more. And probably maybe the good network, the system which monitors all these aspects, whether okay. these news reaches to you or not, we are not aware. But you know, Also, I think there's we have so much emphasis place. being laid on teachers and teachers have their own concerns. But I do want to stress the state governments have a certain responsibility here. The money goes to them and they spend the money. Sir. They should monitor how it's spent and we'll certainly encourage them to do that. I am associated with teacher education. When we talk about teacher education and in the context context of RT, teacher education programs either at pre-service or at in-service level should take priority. Correct. So I would like to know uh, your ministry in the 12th year plan, are they thinking in any way differently in a strategic manner from what has been the plight of teacher education? If there is anything I would like to know you could share with the audience. Very, very important you. question. You're so right. We're trying to do a great deal on this. First of all, we're trying to put more resources into it. We're trying to get higher quality of teacher education. Then we're also raising the eligibility requirements. But when I say higher quality, I'll give you one example in Maharashtra just last year. Justice Varma, the fam same Justice Varma we've all heard about recently, headed a committee which actually looked at 291 teacher training institutions okay. and found 270 of them were unsuitable and should be closed down. So there is a huge challenge in actually ensuring that our teachers are taught properly before they can teach. <laughs> Now, there need to be all sorts of incentives, and the government doesn't have to have all the answers. We are trying to put in money. Uh, at the district level, there are teacher training institutions. At the zonal level, at the state level, we're providing resources for teachers to be trained. We are, we are doing all of that. But I, I like the fact, for example, quite recently, I was at a, at a private function associated with a rival television channel where they gave awards to the best teachers around the country. Now, this kind of thing, if we can encourage teachers to feel that what they're doing is appreciated, is recognized, is rewarded, even in something as glamorous as a television show, the way in which uh, a, a Bollywood star would get a Best Actor Oscar, you can be proud of a Best Teacher award. I mean, that sort of thing seems to me should also try and raise the attractiveness of the profession. Finally, salaries. This is one area where I think the government's got it right, but the Six Pay Commission, salaries are now pretty good for teachers. It no longer is. <laughs> no? All the teachers disagree with you. All right. Okay, that lady uh, over there has a, a question. It's a good deal better than it used to be. You asked the question. Let, let Nene, ask the question. There is a problem of para teachers, uh, Dr. Thrur, when you talk about salary. So, if we have to bring, because para teachers are the need, in a way, becoming a need to fulfillment because of RT requirement, I, my suggestion is that we should pay much more attention now to on job, uh, on site. Uh, facilitation and enrichment of teachers rather than having those structured in-service programs. Maybe that would infuse quality in the 
contextual situation okay. in a better manner. And refresher training of teachers, by the way, while they're still this teaching, one, so they the don't just get Not stuck in a rut. Yeah. 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 Distance and onsite both should come. <coughs> yes. okay. Let Thank us ask you. a question. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Thirur. My question is that we've been talking about infrastructure for schools. Sure. We are talking about pumping in a lot of resources into the education sector, into the government school sector. But have we ever asked ourselves the question as to why are those schools being used as cattle sheds? Why is the, why are, where are those teachers? And we can we can change the curriculum of this of uh, we can change that we can put in money for teacher training but what are the kind of people who are coming into becoming teachers into the profession if you go into a school and ask young people today how many of you want to come into becoming school teachers i don't think there are any in this young audience over here who would like to become a school teacher and we need to ask ourselves that hard and critical question is why aren't young people wanting to become school teachers and then we will find perhaps some difficult truths in our in our system that is plaguing our well, system. Let me say I've actually done exactly what you're saying. I've gone to schools and asked kids, so what do you want to be? You know, particularly 12th standard kids. And you're totally right. I get lots of hands going up to be software engineers, to be doctors, to be IAS officers. I have rarely have ever seen a hand going up saying I want to be a teacher. Part of the problem is perhaps the perception that the profession is not very well rewarded, is not particularly glamorous, etc. Which is a shame because after all we come from an ancient culture where teaching was deeply respected, where the guru was supposed to be more important than the... Why don't we allow foreign direct investment in higher education? Like in Singapore we have uh, Yale and US, so why can't we have something like that in India? I agree with you totally. In fact, uh, first of all, FDI in higher education is allowed right now, but many institutions, particularly reputable ones, are waiting for the foreign education providers bill that was introduced in our parliament to pass. So there's a legislative framework. But why aren't we moving fast we enough on passing then? Well, you tell me how dysfunctional Parliament has been over the last couple of years. In the last session, our government had listed 25 bills to be passed. Three passed because so no, but let's look at the bills that passed. The bills and disruption on SCST promotion were passed. So wherever there is a political imperative for the no, government there is to very ram much a political through. imperative on this. You push it there's through. Been physically, very little time available, sadly. To push legislation. No, but it's through. a question of priority, Dr. Harun. But the fact is, this is also Education a is clearly not so much a priority. SCST quotas are, so you push that through and education bills can languish. No, we don't want education bills to languish. These are our bills. No, but if they are your bills, then why is the government not pushing them through with the, the same sort of ferocity? The government would dearly the like SCST to push all the bills through if the opposition would let parliament function. The honest truth is very simple. We've got 11 higher education bills pending at various stages, either in the standing committees or introduced or having come through the standing committees but not even voted. We would like to see all 11 of them pass. Can we get them through? Other ministries have bills also pending. The dysfunctionality of parliament has affected government initiatives. So wherever there's a the vote world. bank imperative, that bill no, goes no, through. Education is a fundamental national priority for us. We want to see these 11 bills. But it's not a vote bank priority. Education providers is one of them. And I do want to stress the girl is totally correct. Yale would have been willing to come here. They've gone to Singapore because they didn't, weren't sure about how they could do this here in our country. We've got Indian students going to Singapore and even Qatar and Doha and, and, and Abu Dhabi to study in Western universities because they feel it's closer to home and cheaper than studying in the West. And they go to places like Australia and so on where some of them have got beaten up a few years ago. Why do they do that? Because there isn't enough capacity in India. We need to create an environment that creates more seats in this country in higher education. You know, the IITs, for example, Harvard takes about 10 or 11 percent of those who apply to Harvard. The IITs take 0.01 percent. Because that's all they have room for. They're looking at a country with enormous pressure on education and not enough institutions to cope. I would like to do everything possible from the ministry side to encourage the public and private sector to create more. So will things change in the budget session or not? We certainly hope so. We intend to push as many of these bills through as possible. It's not only our ministry that decides. There is a collective exercise by the government because every ministry has got pending bills they want to get through. But we right. hope there will be a few education bills through as well. Uh, my question, Dr. Tharoor, is that when a student comes out after attending a college or an institution of higher education in a country like USA, he is an inventor or she is an inno innovat inno innovator and an inventor. But when a student comes out from an institution of higher education in India, all they have is uh, theoretical knowledge and um, textbook knowledge and they contribute to the economy in a much different way. So why, don't you think the um, system should change? It is changing and we've got very important proposals on the anvil exactly for that. For example, one of these pending bills we've been talking about, young man, is a bill that would set up 14 innovation universities with autonomy to do just research and innovation. In the meantime, pending that bill passing, we're already setting up 
innovation clusters on a number of campuses, including existing IITs. We're trying to encourage more research and innovation coming out. Why do you think we don't have any universities in the top 200 Times Education rankings or QS rankings or whatever? Very simple. Most of these rankings are heavily weighted towards research, whereas our university system traditionally has been heavily weighted towards teaching. These are teaching universities, not research universities. But the problem is, without heavy research, you don't get worldwide recognition. And we're going to try and ensure that research comes in at a very serious level and therefore innovation as well. We're also encouraging private industry to collaborate with academia in order to see what kinds of research they want to see done for the products they're, they're manufacturing. So we can get the academia industry interface connected to try and improve innovation as well. We're very much on the ball on this one. Hi, I teach in Delhi University, Dr. Tharoor, right. um, where you studied. So I think from being net consumers of knowledge, we need to become producers of knowledge. Totally. So if there's a knowledge pyramid globally, we need to be at the top of the pyramid and not at the bottom. How we get there, I have differences with him and perhaps with you, sir, too. Because just getting Yale and Harvard into India will not make us net producers. In fact, I think there could be the case that there is an agenda, I don't know whether if it's hidden or not so hidden, to somehow synergize higher education in India, state, especially state-funded higher education in India with global norms, which sounds very kosher, which sounds like the right thing to do, but ultimately it also runs the danger of making us more efficient consumers of knowledge that is produced elsewhere. I mean, we have the argumentative Indian is good for India. And we don't need to shut up the argumentative Indian by shutting down our public university. Isn't that what this show is all about? I think <laughs> seeing a lot of argumentative Indians. I agree with you, Professor Mukherjee. The fact is, there is no question that we do need to do a lot of this. But I do not agree that we're only interested in knowledge produced and elsewhere. Our Prime Minister is committed publicly to doubling the amount of our uh, government budget that goes towards R&D from 1% to 2 the 1% is already a significant improvement on what we were doing just five, six years ago. We are trying, we've got a National Innovation Council that's working on this. We're trying to stimulate research across the board, across the university system. And if the bill that I mentioned, the National Innovation Universities Bill, is passed, there'll be 14 universities which the private sector can fund if they want to. That will be autonomous and focused on research. So we need to do this, but we want to be producers of knowledge. Let me add, to some degree, we already are much more than before. Many of these foreign companies, you're talking about IBM and GE and so on, have more researchers in India than they have in their parent countries. And they are producing innovations that are then marketed worldwide. So we are already producing knowledge that is going into our country. The first iPad, you know, was actually invented by a company in Hyderabad mm -hmm. called Portal Player, which then got manufactured in China to be sold in America. But the knowledge came from here, and we have the capacity to do that. Okay, this gentleman has a question. Yeah. Good afternoon, Tharoor, Dr. Tharoor. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask about tuition as an industry that is, you know, all over the place and yet we have done nothing about it and in this age we still are you know fighting with fake universities and the UGC has put up 22 universities on the website I mean how is the government thinking of it and doing proactive uh, measures have been taken there's been a report that's been done right sir studying uh, the so-called deemed universities and putting them in three categories and the 32 are the ones in the third category or category C who we feel aren't good enough to be universities they've all gone to court though and they right. said that you know they've got a stay order so right now they are still there but I agree with you that quality is of great importance and of greater importance now than, we were simply, than when we were simply trying to grow up from a 17% literacy country. You know, in 1950, we had just 70 universities in the entire country. Uh, we, we have now gone to 670, right? We've got something like 33,000 colleges. So we've got a massive increase in institutions. I can't tell you that every one of them it deserves the name. But we needed that expansion because our population was growing. Too many people have been left out. We needed to give them opportunities for education. Now the time has come to really ensure that the education offered is of the quality that we need to ensure. And that will include disaffiliation of certain universities, closing down some universities, uh, it will in, or, or colleges or institutions. It will involve a much tougher, no, again, one of these bills, accreditation. We're going to make accreditation mandatory. And the process of being accredited will involve no, but imagine the plight of those students who are studying at these so-called fake universities. They don't know what will happen in the courts and they don't know. No, no, we obviously at the end ensure they're the protected talk. by being migrating to, our, to other recognized universities. Yeah, but people are having so much difficulty trying to get into a college in the first place. And at the end of it, their degree could be completely worthless. Well, look, in any case, the quality of your degree in the eyes of a potential employer, for example, will also obviously reflect the quality of the institution you've attended. 
So whether it's on the website as a fake university or whether it's a, it's not. People know which universities produce decent students and how you perform in the application and the interview. But I agree with you, we can't leave students high and dry and we eventually will not. Because even the committee that did this report said there should be provisions for migrating from disaffiliated universities to others. But disaffiliation is an increasingly necessary option. And when we get this uh, accreditation authority established and make accreditation mandatory, you will find that there will have to be steps taken to tell certain institutions, sorry, you simply don't make the cut. We haven't been tough enough for good reasons, perhaps. We will now start having to be it tough. Take 20 years time. for the court to reach its verdict. The court At the end of it, an entire generation of students find out that their education means nothing. Let's take a question from this lady over here. There is no uniform system in probably medical and engineering uh, colleges, which is why I think uh, there is a prevalence of donations and middlemen also so how does the government address that part of it and well, when i talk about donations i'm not talking any small sum it's I a know. huge huge amount we actually have one institute. more bill pending in parliament <laughs> which is called the unfair practices bill in which we have actually outlawed donations capitation fees misleading advertisements giving fee structures on the website and then actually charging something else when the parents so come that does all of these practices uh, you know, paying teachers an official salary and then taking a cutback. All of these are being outlawed with very severe criminal penalties. Again, this is a bill that needs to pass. If only for the last couple of years, Parliament had been allowed to function in the normal number of hours it functions, most of these bills would be law today. Hello, sir. My name is Sheila. I'm from Teach for India. We recruit our country's most driven, committed young people to teach for two years in Great. schools serving the poor. And contradictory to what a lot of, what a lot of you said, um, this year, over 10,000 people applied from the top colleges and corporates in the country. So there are people who want to teach Great. kids um, from poor communities. Um, I just want to make a comment on the discussion. I think we mostly have been talking about 10th standard college, elite nursery schools. And because of dropout rates yeah. in the country, actually these are issues only pertaining to a minority of people. And I'm curious to you. How much of your time is being spent on education for the poor and for those dropouts and for those kids who do not get excellent education versus all of these other issues, which are important but only affect elite Indians? She's totally right. You know, our gross enrollment ratio at college level is just 18.9% of the population, which is against a worldwide norm of about 29%. It's really shocking how much kids are losing out by dropping out at various stages of the educational process from class 8 onwards. We're losing them. And first of all, it wouldn't matter so much if we got them thoroughly well educated by class 8, if they could read and write a proper sentence, if they could function in a, in a society that we hope will one day become a knowledge society. But sadly, many of them don't. They're not well enough equipped. And indeed, we need to concentrate a lot of our energies on that. A lot of this work is being done by state governments, state education ministries, by NGOs like yours. And I want to congratulate those who are doing that. But we, we, are, we are conscious of this problem, hugely. Okay. You know, somehow it's come back full circle to what I had said that, you know, uh, the government school system, I mean, you know, it's all very well to say this, uh, that it's not a universal figure. But the, if you take a national figure and uh, look at the number of children who go to government schools, it's far, far larger than the number of kids who go to the private schools. Uh, so we're coming back into that same situation. We're looking at the dropout rates. Most of the dropout rates that you're talking about pertain to the government school system. Uh, again, therefore, yeah. on one hand, you say uh, it's not a national figure. But on the other hand, when it when it comes down to talking about dropout rates, sure. uh, you're referring to the, to, to the government school system. You cannot possibly say that, oops, uh, the states have to do it or the private sector has to do it. Yeah, everyone the, has the, the philosophy, the whole direction has to come from the HRD ministry and, and say does. that this is what needs to be done. And therefore, what are your views going forward on bringing education back into schooling? And what is the HRD ministry going to do for the country? Because it is the central ministry. And when it suits, then we say it's the states. When it doesn't suit, it says... No, 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 no. The states have to implement particularly at school education. But if so they the don't, national then policies what does the are made do? by the Ministry of Human Resource Development. And what's more, the national policies and the national funding comes from the central government. Right. And that's where we're trying to put the effort in. I, I agree with most of what you said. Frankly, we'd all like to do this, but I think none of us has a magic bullet. We're trying to get the things done. I think it's right that we have created a very effective national curriculum framework. We are, as I said, trying to improve our teaching capacity and key, attract and retain teachers. Through midday meals, we're trying to keep poor kids in schools. We're trying to do all of these things. 
Human beings are flawed. Some teachers don't show up or they show up, sign and disappear. That kind of absenteeism has to be curbed. We can't pretend that we can sit in Delhi in a ministry and ensure that some village in UP there is a teacher who's showing up and staying there. But it needs to be done and we've got to try and get, get, get to that direction. All of these, there have been, the figures show dramatic improvements in the levels of enrollment of all these categories. These are not being left behind. We all agree on what needs to be done. Sometimes the issue is how and how the actual implementation takes place, which is where there are flaws. No one can pretend that anything in our country is perfect. There are things where we have the right aspiration, we have a good policy framework and a decent vision, but getting it done to the nuts and bolts requires effort, commitment, diligence, honesty, all of which commodities are unevenly provided and available in our society. But look, you've been heard, right to be heard, and you're right. So as far as I'm concerned, this has been a very educative conversation for all of us. Uh, gentlemen, the system changes every four to five years, and so do the ministers, you know. Or so, sometimes less. <laughs> I mean, so my question is that, you know, every system experiments a certain, you know, a decision they take. So they experiment with four years of our schooling lives. For example, the CCE. So four years of our schooling life is, you know, spent with your experiments. So what if we don't agree with these experiments? What happens, with the, what, what happens when we don't experiment? We don't agree with your experiments. You know, <laughs> just give well, look, all I can say is that we are trying to do our best in terms of what we believe is right for the country, what's right for the student. We have... Um, we have certainly, in coming up with the CCE, we've certainly taken into account the views of students and teachers and principals. And we felt it was the right thing to do. Now, if some children wish they didn't have that system, I'm sorry. When I mean, once a policy like this is made, it does affect everyone. And I think that there's, there is something. If, if at the end of a certain period, we are completely convinced we were wrong, I think we'll have to say we were wrong. But right now, we believe we are right. And we believe that continuous and comprehensive evaluation is the way to go in the interest of the child. Okay, last question, quick. Okay, Dr. Tharoor, I wanted to say is education only for the Khas Admi? And I'll tell you why. This whole myth that the RT has been implemented is wrong. If you go to just Noida schools or Gurgaon schools or any state in India, I called up even Bangalore schools, they have not implemented RT. That means the 25% seat free seats also have not been given. Forget about the other 75%. Then, Kendra Vidyale. You have MP quota in Kendra Vidyale? member of parliament quota and Kendra Vidale, then I am told that there is also DDA quota where Kendra Vidale is on lease land. Now, is then in private schools, we obviously have management quota and this actually stretches much, which is illegal and stretches to the entire 75%. Is education only for the Khas Admi? No, but I can tell you that not all your examples support that question. For I example, can, the I MP quota, I am an MP, right? Uh, and certainly my quota, which used to be two and has now gone to six, doesn't go to Khas Admi. I get each year for those first two seats and now for six seats between 250 and 280 people applying. And I give them to very ordinary, simple, poor people who have aspirations for their child and who, who come to me and who I feel make a compelling case. Maybe. And the fact is, I think that's how most MPs use this. The fact is that Kendra, Kendra Vidyale has a great strength of being good education at an affordable cost. And that's why it, it, it actually is not about Khas Admi at all. Kendra Vidyale is a way of helping Aam Aadmi become class, perhaps. But uh, across the board, we are trying to do our best. Fortunately, we have been, been having a very nice discussion about policies, about intentions of the government doing good and everything else. But at the end of the day, what does it come down? You just palm, the government is just palming on stuff to private schools, uh, loading them down with you know more and more responsibility and asking them to perform. Mm -hmm. Then when you have private uh, universities coming up, you shut them down because they can't be monitored and therefore they are fraud. So what is the government actually teaching me at the end of the day? I have no idea actually, seriously. No, no, that's and I believe it's just, just populist, uh, you know, policy that you're having just to show that you're doing good. That's all you're doing. That's simply, it doesn't come down to simply nothing. simply not reasonable. No, in <laughs> fact, while accepting completely that a lot needs to be done to improve the government schools, to suggest that the burden is being shifted entirely to the private sector is simply not wrong. We see the private sector as partners in our development. We feel they too can pull their weight. There was a time in which... There was a time in which the government wanted to do everything, where the public sector hogged the space, where the private sector was squeezed to the margins. Today, it's, you should actually welcome the fact that across the board at all levels of education and other areas of our nation's activity, the private sector is given an honored place and given an opportunity. But the government is not moving away from its responsibilities. It has taken on its responsibilities. We're spending more and more money than we've ever spent before each year. We're trying to do more things with it, create more institutions, educate more children, include more underprivileged and excluded groups. And we've done all this, I believe, in ways which may not be perfect, but which are a downside better 
than anything that obtained just a few years ago. This gentleman has a question. Dr. Thiru, two questions. Uh, one, just about what you talked about. I, I'm somebody who counsels and helps guide students make career choices and career plans. Now, the one thing that if I can, one word if I can use to describe the state of students in higher secondary education and their parents is stressed. Yeah. Several reasons. There's a shortage of good seats. You've talked about that. The government in, has increased the number of IITs and seats. And so that's being addressed. The other is information. You're talking about accreditation. There are already three different bodies who accredit it. There is an AICT, there's a medical council, there's a bar council, there's a UGC, there's a distance education council. Now, simple things like information from these bodies is not up to date and easily available to a common person. You go onto their website, data is often two years old, right? So that's one question and uh, that's something that's that your support. ministry can very clearly enforce and make available very easily for students. I, I honestly don't know if you're right because actually I do see, for example, the ICT's reliance on the website obliges them to keep it up to date, practically day to day. There are no penalties for any institution which doesn't update its information. I see what you mean. So the right. information so there has submitted to be by some institutions is two years old. Perhaps that may be so. Yeah. Right. That's so that's, that's one point. The other is yeah. about uh, students being able to make choices and you know we're talking about in the last year and a half there have been a lot of changes towards moving towards a common one single exam be that towards engineering be that in medicine um, is that something as a plan from the ministry that's going to be only further sharpened going forward because as of now you have an engineering entrance exam but every private university can still have its own exam at the postgraduate at the medical level you do have a NEET at the postgraduate level but every medical college has still through going through a recourse of the court can have their own entrance exam. So it's not really solved the issue of having to take 12 entrance exams to try and get a shot at higher education. So what education. you prefer is one common examination. Is, that, is that what the plan is? Well, that certainly was the philosophy behind the what we did for engineering. It was again before my time, so I wasn't involved in the discussions myself. But the philosophy was very much that we should actually make it easier on the students. You're right that every private college has its own admissions tests. And that would apply in medicine and engineering and across the board. So if you're saying could we have one nationwide exam that the private and the public and all institutions accept, that's certainly worth thinking about. We haven't got there yet, but I'll take the idea because back. Because that's to the often a question, you know, about. this talk about a common SAT-like kind yeah. of a exam. Is right. that something? Because the question mark and not knowing is what makes it harder for students and parents to navigate. Now, I'll take this idea back to the ministry and we'll see whether we can. I'm glad. You know, the right this to be heard, right platform to be heard. Yeah, you're being is functioning well. But, you know, you, on a couple of instances, you pointed out how you weren't part of the deliberations in the past, uh, indicating maybe that your personal views could be different from the policy that's been put no, in place. No, just that earlier, I wasn't familiar with all the thinking that went into earlier, the Earlier, we had Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi as the HRD minister, and he wanted people to learn astrology, and he wanted to make that, uh, you know, an official subject. Now, the question is that there is no continuity in what we do in the education sector. So people Welcome can to parliamentary democracy. <laughs> no, but there is, there, is, there is continuity in the sense that certainly the UPA government has one policy. We're not rolling back any of the reforms initiated by Mr. Palam Raju's predecessor, Kapil Sibyl. We are, as far as the government is concerned, we're following one coherent line. We're just trying to implement it effectively. And of course, where some things haven't been done, we're trying to complete the incompleted task. Everything today is better than it was not just when we got our independence, it's a lot better than then, but it's a lot better than it was just All right, On that ago. hopeful note, let's end this program. The minister says people and their concerns have been heard. He takes them back with him. Let's hope he also acts on those concerns and ensures that this platform yields results. Thank you very much, Dr. Shashi Thank you. for joining us on the Right to be Heard Town Hall. This is the first time at the end of the program that the audience has written a round of applause. Thank you all very much for joining us. We're slipping into a break. News and updates continue on the other side.